Hello, this is Paolo Copage and welcome back to another episode of our Sleepy Sunday Let's Play with the game, The Away Team. Lost Exodus! Exclamation point. It hasn't got an exclamation point. I'm making that up, but I, I, I think if it did have an exclamation point, it'd make it that a little bit more dramatic. It'd be like, Lost Exodus! You know, as opposed to Lost Exodus. But hey-ho, we won't dwell upon that. Uh, we are, yes, uh, we're doing alright. This is, this is... Well, I've had better starts with this game, put it that way, both on screen and off. Uh, we've lost two people. We've lost our celebrity, uh, well, who would appear to be a reality type of celebrity, which I suppose isn't really a celebrity, but let's not get down that rabbit hole. And then we lost our clown, our super funny guy, who was going to keep everyone's morale up. Now we've just got the serious people left and Dr. Phil. But hey ho, I'm not one to judge. They're alive. Oh, and a, a freaking space wizard. I mean,. Magic tricks, that pleases everybody. That, that ticks all the boxes from morale boosting, I, I feel. I feel. So here's hoping that we're not going to lose anyone else in the immediate future. I can't see us making all the way with everyone, but to lose two in the first episode is not a good start. But hey-ho, I digress. Let's crack on, shall we? Now, as you can see, we are... Well, we, we, we've done this. We have turned uh, the cheat on to be able to know how many stops there are per area. Just so we don't waste fuel, because fuel and food can be quite tight at times. So, um, hopefully, we're going to get something which isn't going to be, well, as morose as well. It was it was quite a... Oh, he went. It was quite a depressing episode for the first episode. You know, we, we managed to find a... Oh, press this. Uh, oh, it's two on this one. Uh, we managed to find a... Um, a, a space station, which had been converted from one of the previous ships which left... The, the earth in order to go and find stuff and everybody was dead everybody was dead dave but hey ho again not really our fault the first person we lost couldn't do anything about the second we thought fortune favored the brave apparently not in this game <laughs> but hey ho never mind so this is a star class of g which i i presume would be good Probably not. Look at it. Gravelly. G for gravelly. Uh, it's a planet. It's Terran, which is awesome. Surface temperature of 30 degrees. So lovely. T-shirt weather. 5% uh, oxygen. That doesn't sound like a lot, but I know that the atmosphere in the Earth isn't made up of that much oxygen. Uh, or habitability is 24.21%. I mean, that's about the same as Liverpool. So, it, you know, we're not doing too bad there. Anyway, summary. The atmosphere of this planet is completely unsuitable for human life or indeed any form of life you can think of. In fact, it might very well be comparable with what Earth's atmosphere likely looks like at this point, choked with toxic gases. Oh dear. Beneath the dense dark cloud cover, however, there's definitely a solid surface and a very good chance of finding some sort of fuel for the ship. Even if sending the crew down to look around is a risk, it's a calculated one. Well, I am all for calculated risks. But who do we send? Who do we send? Um, I, I know it's our second run and there's a good chance we're going to lose everyone i think you need to send at least two people so i'm thinking we send jean-luc and Jordi this time around i mean they're, they're, they're hardened to away missions jean-luc generally likes to go on every away mission anyway although according to the book he shouldn't he should stay on the ship so i think as a leader it's a no-brainer Jordi laforge you're an engineer. Can I get away with two? I think I'm going to wave two. We don't need no stinking medics, do we? I mean, I don't really just want to leave the space with him by himself. He, he needs company. We'll leave him with Dr. Phil. I'm, I'm sure that'll be fine. So, Jean-Luc is the role of medic as well. That's absolutely fine. All the sensor readings are a bit strange, admittedly. Everything indicates that there's no possible way anything in this is alive down there. And yet some of the results are in line with what you'd expect to see if life forms were present. There were earth creatures who lived in some pretty inhospitable environments. Certain worms, bacteria and the like thrived at the bottom of the ocean around geothermal vents, for example. If there's anything down there, it is probably something like that. So as long as the crew keeps their suits on, they should be just fine. I'm not planning on telling them to take it off. These are the more of the two sensible of the next generation characters, so I'd like to think they're not going to take off the suit. Guess we'll see. Surely the biggest challenge, however, will be finding a place to set the shuttle down safely. Once inside the atmosphere, it becomes clear that the planet is very geothermally active, and much of the terrain is covered in molten rock that's hot enough to melt important pieces of the shuttle within a few minutes of setting down. You instruct the crew to try one of the poles, as they do appear a bit cooler and more stable, and they adjust the course accordingly. Alright. 
hike to the Northern Pole, approach the Southern Pole. Well, I, I presume the uh, this planet Santa would be on the Northern Pole, so it makes sense to go to the North Pole. It will be showered with gifts of fuel and food. That's 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 what I think. Uh, your crew, led by Jean-Luc Picard, manages to find a decent spot for the shuttle to land after a few passes. They select a high plateau overlooking a narrow valley, choked with what at first glance looks like something halfway between dirty water and tar, or perhaps molasses. The ambient temperature... Bear with me, need to fast forward this. Uh, the ambient temperature outside is high enough to keep whatever it is flowing rather freely. However, and in fact a small stream of the stuff trickles past the shuttle about 100 metres out before running off the side of a cliff in a short tar fall. Oh, but that's beautiful. But that's beautiful. As the crew vacates the shuttle, albeit with some reluctance, they find the terrain solid and safe enough, if a bit sticky. Bits of the black, gold-flecked stuff cling to the bottom of the crew's boots, but appears to pose no harm to either crew or suit. It will probably take a bit of effort to wash off, however. Ready for anything, Jean-Luc Picard looks around, but sees nothing of particular interest, so they throw the decision to you. Sensors show nothing in the immediate area, so it's exploration no matter what. The crew could investigate the tarry stream in the distance, or search for a way to descend into the valley where there might be more to look at. I mean, the stream could be fuel. We could, we could probably use it for fuel. We've come here for fuel. It's stated that there is fuel here. I think we should go to the stream. Logic dictates. I am an AI, after all. From a distance, the stream the crew saw looked all, almost like a fast-flowing stream of dirty runoff, or perhaps even raw sewage. But up close, it's clearly much thicker, almost tar-like. Sensor readings detect a number of things, but most important among them is the presence of hydrocarbons. If the crew can concoct some way to collect some of this material, they could transport enough back to the ship to help replenish the food replicator. Nice! As is, this stuff is neither nutritious nor appealing, but as raw starter material, it's as good as anything else. Right. Julian Ford suggests that the crew might be able to repurpose some of the spare atmospheric suits on the shuttle to carry some of the substance. They're watertight and impervious to just about everything, they say, and seeing as we don't exactly have any buckets lying around, it's probably our best option. The crew manages to find a spare suit on the shuttle and fills it up with the blackish gold goop, sealing it shut before stowing it on board. Nice. Reading's all normal, so keep at it. Well, I don't get a choice in this, so let's do it. The crew looks around for a while but finds nothing of interest that they haven't already taken note of and or sampled in some fashion. Keep your aisles peeled. They're just about to turn back to the shuttle when there's a strange sound nearby, a cross between a rumble and a squelch, as if someone had dropped a wet thousand kilogram sponge off of a tall building. When they turn to look, they see that a giant humanoid form has erupted from the ground, formed from tar-like sludge. It has no visible face, but a head and arms can clearly be made out. Whether it's mocking or mimicking the human form, or this is its natural shape, it's unclear. What quickly becomes evident, however, is that it's intelligent, because it begins to communicate with the crew. Are you hearing this? asks Jean-Luc Picard. You respond negatively. I think it's using some sort of telepathy. They continue. I can hear it in my head. I know it's ridiculous, but still. Tell me what it's saying so I can assist. It's angry that we're here, says Jean-Luc Picard, and it wants to know what we think we're doing. Tell it you're looking for food. Tell it you're looking for fuel. Tell it that it's none of its business. Ignore it. It's probably not any real threat. Uh, well. Hmm. A giant humanoid f form. I, I, I presume that means bigger than us. So to ignore it is probably a silly thing to do. As it stands, we're lower on food than we are fuel. And I don't really want to tell it to, it's none of its business. So uh, we'll say we're looking for food. Jean-Luc Picard relays the response and then listens intently for a few moments. You almost wonder if they're hallucinating. Telepathy isn't something you thought was possible. Of course, if it's a hallucination, then they're still managing to communicate. Oh, and they're still managing to communicate, then maybe it doesn't matter if it's a mental communication or not. A lot could be conveyed through chemicals, subsonic transmissions and so on. There are plenty of ways to reach a brain short of the paranormal. It says it will let us have all the food we need, says Jean-Luc Picard, but only if we agree to do something for it. What does it want? They go on to explain and translate for several minutes, explaining that the creature wants another creature defeated. Apparently the entire planet is somehow under the control of just two sentient beings, and despite how large it is, the planet's just not big enough for the both of them. Sure, I guess, says Jean-Luc Picard. It takes you a second to realise that they weren't addressing you. They were talking to the creature. No, wait. Ask it. Before you can ask the crew to reply, the creature appears to dissolve into the ground once again. Apparently it assumes the crew will comply. 
So uh, I sort of might have implied consent. So now what do we do? Asked Jean-Luc Picard. Oh, Jean-Luc, that's not very Jean-Luc of you. Under normal circumstances, you imagine a decision like this wouldn't even be a consideration. But the crew hasn't really been under normal circumstances since the day you all left Earth. Weird situations were bound to occur. You go fight the other creature, I suppose. You get the hell out of there. I'm thinking we get the hell out of there. I mean, it's a giant humanoid, but it's not planetary big. So we could be like, yeah, sure, we'll help you out. And then leg it. I think I think that's it. Because are we on the are we on the goody side? Are we on the baddy side? We d we don't know. We don't know. We could go and kill this thing and find out this person is the evil person. So I say person, thing, thing, alien, planet, whatever. Anyway, we might not be on the good side here. That's what I'm trying to say. So I think we should get the hell out of here. Let's not get involved in politics. Politics is, pfft, yeah, not good. Not good. Let's get the hell out of here. Despite the fact that the humans are your primary concern and possibly your only one, you can't really see how it's in their interest to sign off on what might amount to murder. See, you, you know how humans are with their guilt and regret. Even if they pull this off and get all the food they can eat, what then? They'll be moping and questioning and doubt for months, if not the rest of their lives. Maybe it's worth risking some physical discomfort to save them the emotional baggage later on. The crew returns to the shuttle. Before... They get a chance to board or prepare further. Two creatures made of sludge and tar rise up in front of them, blocking their path. Okay. If there are any differences between the two, they are not apparent. Uh, Houston, we have a problem, says Jean-Luc Picard. The one on the left seems to be upset that we agreed to fight it, and the one on the right is saying it's upset that we're not fighting the other one yet. They're bickering like children, except in our heads, not using words. Jean-Luc Picard suggests that the crew might spin this into a social battle instead. What do you mean, you ask? This thing can read minds, they say. So if we're going to do that, you'd better come up with something and tell us what to do without explaining the reasoning. Uh, before we can react, rush it and attack. Maybe try to battle it mentally. Tell them you refuse to get involved in this dispute. Tell them you want a team contest. Hmm. Well, as I said, I don't know if we're on the good side or not here. I'm, I'm trying to be as diplomatic as possible. It's like the first directive. You know, you don't get involved in the politics on different planets. Uh, maybe try to battle it mentally. Tell them you refuse to get involved. I'm going to get everyone killed here, aren't I? You know what? We're going to role play here. We're with the Starfleet Federation. I, I, I think I think we tell them we, we're not going to get involved because it's not our fight. No one died. Uh, <laughs> I'll just wait for those crosses to come across the portraits. Uh, you tell the crew to not play this game anymore. If the creature have a problem with each other, if the creatures have a problem with each other, let them fight it out. The crew may die, but they will not die as the playthings of some sadistic alien tarball. Both creatures seem taken aback at this, and they dissolve into puddles. A moment later, the two puddles coalesce, and a single creature appears, twice as tall. They're the same creature, says Jean-Luc Picard. Indeed, it makes sense. You run some more scans. More focus now than you know what you're looking at for, and the results confirm your suspicions. The entire planet is covered in the same black goop almost equally, though at various depths. There are not two or more creatures on this planet. There is only one. The planet is the creature, one symbiotic whole. You're not sure what the game was exactly, but you're sure it's over. You order the crew to board the shuttle. As they do so, the creature deposits some of its material outside the door. A going away gift? A booby prize? Who knows? The crew accepts it regardless. No sense leaving behind something that might prove useful. The crews will leave when the shuttle finally reconnects to the ship, and they don't even bother to eat or clean up before collapsing into their bunks to decompress. You can only assume they're thinking the same thing you are, that this was some sort of test. And they too are wondering if they passed, or failed. So, awesome. We survived completely. Can't moan at that. Cannot moan at that. That is a win in my book. And on to Jeter79. Oh, the crew are flashing. What's going on here? Jean Mook is flashing. Uh, I, now, this is a new thing. I presume we can rank him up. Experience one leader. Experience, le experience leaders perform better in situations requiring social interaction. Uh, well, there's nothing I can click, so I presume that is it. It's just the fact he's leveled up. And then we've got, oh, is that, that tells you the mission, and he's an engineer. 
and Space Wizard. He's everything because he survived. <laughs> I mean, what's the picture? Plateau photo, jump one, Le Guin 49. A suit cam photo that Jean-Luc Picard took of the plateau near the North Pole of Le Guin 49 that the crew explored. Nice. Nice. I guess they just level up automatically then. Tip top. I mean, those guys are deed. Deceased. <gasps> Archdiocese dies of asphyxiation. When Trident Trap pierced their helmet and skull. Oh, it actually lists how they died as well. That's awesome. Uh, Bozef Jokestar died of a critical trauma after being crushed by a free floating engine. Hmm. But we don't like to talk about that. We don't like to talk about that. As it stands, food and fuel is pretty equal. So that's pretty cool. Oh dear. Summary. Although your mission isn't a scientific one, there are a number of stellar and interstellar phenomena you have been programmed to observe and study should the opportunity arise. Possible benefits range from expanding the boundaries of human knowledge to discoveries that may lead to improvement of ship systems. There's also value in giving the crew something to focus on for a while. This sounds bad. Mission underway. Although the mission is... Oh, we've read this bit. Uh, da -da -da -da, possible... Long range sensors pick, picked it up a day ago. And you have been monitoring its progress since to see how closely its trajectory aligns with the ships. You call the crew into the shuttle to discuss. In the distance is an increasingly active star, spitting plasma off into space. Perform a cursory inspection then. Coronal mass ejection events and, and associated flares have been observed as far as the 1800s, but nothing as intense as what appears to be brewing here. You calculate that the star will soon generate events in excess of both Carrington-class and Fredrickson-class storms by several orders of magnitude. The prospects of taking time out to research something new seem to excite the crew. I've never seen anything like this, says Dr. Phil. Oh, Dr. Phil's seen a lot, you know. Jean-Luc Picard lets out a long whistle and murmurs, Would you look at that? Look at that, says Dr. Phil, pointing out details to the rest of the crew. Clearly they are eager to study further. I mean, it sounds like it's exploding. It's probably not good to hang about, but let's do it. You plot a course into the synchronous orbit that keeps the most active sunspots visible without putting the ship directly in the path of the predicted CMEs and flares. No more detailed study is possible, but it will require modification to some of the ship's sensors, which will reduce their general efficiency for normal operation. I mean, sounds cool enough. You drain the ship's sensors on the sunspots for several days, observing plumes of plasma as they are ejected into space. Accompanying the flares, shifts in the star's magnetic field and cosmic rays exceed any previous events recorded in your databases. Eventually, solar activity begins to subside. Analyze the collected data. The data collected is revealing and provides some possible means of improving ships. Sensor efficiency by a moderate amount. Scientific curiosity satisfied, you plot a course away from AR LV266-2643. Nice. Sensor rage has increased. And, well, it doesn't appear to have any negative effects, so awesome, I guess. Let's crack on, shall we? It looks like we're going through some sort of belt. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Oh, lovely. So it's another uh, G-class star, planet, Terran. Cold, this one, minus 10. Uh, oxygen, around 17%. Gravity is okay. Habitability is up still as well, which is even better. Uh, there are signs of life on this otherwise apparently barren planet, although it's not quite clear what form it takes. The atmosphere is not entirely hospitable to humans, nor indeed any Earth animal you know of, but the sensors indicate that something is definitely down there. Regardless, it's also clear enough that humans or something like them were here in the past you wouldn't know it from the lack of anything in orbit around the planet but sandwiched between several tall mountain ranges on the surface are the ruins of what once have been a small city all right well okay then uh you know what we're, go we're gonna take jean-luc again i think he's the man to lead um we're gonna take geordie in engineer form and uh we're gonna take dr phil because the space wizard fills all of all of everything. He's 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 wonderful. He's leader, med, medic, and engineer. He is the away team by himself. He needs no one. So, there are some sorts of energy signature down there. You tell the crew as the shuttle closes in on the surface. It's not entirely clear what it is, but it's well worth checking out, even if this place doesn't exactly look like home. The signal is not steady. Whatever it is, it pulses 
and the readings from the shuttle sensors rise and fall as it manoeuvres between mountain tops and crumbling old buildings. When the shuttle breaks into the uh, clearing at the centre of the city, however, the signal becomes more steady. It's clearly coming from below the ground, directly underneath a spindly tower or statue of some sort that straddles the entire clearing. Plenty of places to land. Take your pick. The streets of what was once a city are overgrown with scraggly red and black plants, tangled vines and scary looking thorn bushes, but there's ample room amongst the flora for a safe landing. Sensors are clearly detecting life below the surface, you say. It's impossible to tell what. It's organic. It's mobile. That's about all I know. Probably not a plant, but no way to be sure. Could be intelligent, could be dangerous, especially since you are not armed. If you get into trouble, immediately run back to the shuttle. Jean-Luc Picard opens the shuttle door and the crew heads out into the clearing. The undergrowth here is about shin deep, but despite the scary looking thorns, you're confident that an atmospheric suit will be able to withstand whatever it comes into contact with. Beneath the rays of grass and thorny weeds is a quite flat and sturdy surface, apparently made of some sort of stone reinforced with metal rebar based on your scans. Clearly artificial, but then the buildings and giant metal tower already gave that away. There are hollow spaces below, but they're more tunnel than cavern. There are still no better readings or, or on whatever non-plant life forms might be down there. Perhaps the crew will be able to avoid contact entirely. That would be ideal. If you had breath, you wouldn't be holding it, however. Yes, yes. Okay, search nearby buildings. Look underneath the metal tower. Uh, well, let's search the buildings, I guess. The buildings are certainly in line with what you might have expected humans to produce. They're rectangular, the majority being taller than they are wide, and the windows and doors are of similar proportions. The exact purpose of these structures is impossible to discern, however. The exteriors contain no signs or other indication of function, and the interiors, at least those the crews check out, have been stripped clean of anything but walls, ceilings and floors. Not even any furniture, says Jean-Luc Picard. It's like it was all built for people who have never showed up. Or else, if there was anyone here, they took everything with them when they left. Hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of years ago? Who knows? Somewhat curiously, none of the buildings that the crew checks have any means of accessing levels below the surface. There are certainly signs of foundations and utility corridors and the like, but there isn't a single staircase or elevator to be found. Not so much as a trap door with a suspiciously convenient ladder to descend. Ultimately, the crew abandons the search of the interiors, and the search turns to the open area near where the shuttle landed. The dense undergrowth makes the, perf uh, the search difficult, but the plant life is low enough to the ground that the crew feels somewhat safe spreading out a bit. Now that they're looking a bit more closely, it becomes clear that there are soft spots in the terrain, areas where the stony surface is covered instead in scattered rubble and small dirt mounds. Geordie LaForge suddenly stops and holds up their hand. Hold it, everyone, they say. Everyone stops for a minute, and at first there's nothing noticeable. Then, from somewhere near the base of the odd tower, there's a definite skittering and rustling in the bushes, as if something there was scurrying away from the crew. Away from the crew. That's good. If it's to the crew, I'll be a bit more worried. Quick, see what that is. The crew rushes over, headlamps on full brightness, and they just manage to catch a glimpse of a small, hairless albino creature, its hindquarters disappearing into a small hole in the earth. There wasn't much to see, but it was in view long enough to determine that it was about the size of a cat, with a rat-like tail and very long claws on its hind feet. Johnny Picard instructs everyone to turn the lights on their helmets to full brightness and focus on the area around the tower. If it isn't long before Geordie LaForge finds something. Barely visible beside one of the legs of the tower is a small metal hatch, nearly invisible beneath the foliage. After a few minutes of clearing the hat of clearing the hatch is pulled After a few minutes of clearing, the hatch is pulled back, revealing a narrow staircase descending into darkness. Ask the crew to investigate the staircase. Cautiously, well, I haven't got a choice about that. Uh, the crew walks down the steps carefully, the path before them well lit by their headlamps. The stone stairs are unremarkable, as are the landings, spaced out every five metres or so, with the corridor taking a 90 degree turn to the left each time. There are no railings, signs, doorways, or lights anywhere, and the purpose of this stairwell is uncertain. After a dozen or so landings, the walls of the stairwell begin to show signs of decay and disruption. Rather than being smooth and unblemished, there are pock marks of various sizes, the majority large enough to stick an arm into. From within these holes comes a rustling sound, punctuated by periods of rapid skittering as of claws on stone. Something is in there moving around. Geordie Lethorge narrows their eyes and approaches one of the holes cautiously. They slowly peek inside, moving ever so cautiously. I think the walls are full of these things, says Geordie Lethorge. It's like a hive or nest or something, some kind of warren. There could be hundreds of them, maybe thousands. 
more even makes it wouldn't have maybe we couldn't you know it, harvest some of them for food oh dear had a coughing fit right catch some of the creatures better leave them alone they have very sharp claws which are large on their back legs i don't think it's good to just stick your arms into a hole we don't know if that was a, that could have been a baby for all we know we that could have been a, you know a newborn running around using its bambi legs to, to look at its new home and the and the and the mommy and the daddy could be massive huge even so no sir no let's leave them alone i think you nix the idea. While it sounds good in theory, you can't be certain that these creatures aren't intelligent, and so it's probably not advisable to just start eating them. You'd hope the other alien species would give your crew the same benefit of the doubt. Ultimately, the staircase reaches a final landing, at which point you estimate the crew is probably, probably about 100 metres below the surface. By this point, the walls are completely Swiss cheese with holes of various sizes. Fortunately, there must be an, enough structural metal in place to keep the entire thing from collapsing. If the creatures are as active as it appears, it's certainly strong enough that the crew isn't going to cause any further harm. The bottom of the staircase empties into a small antechamber of some sort. There are no doors between this and the next room, but it's clearly a separate space. The doorway features a lowered hatch, sorry, a lowered arch, above which are carved some sort of sigils or, or pictograms. They're somewhat difficult to make out, however. Jordi Laforge takes a closer look at the carvings above the doorway. These are very primitive, they say. Very strange. You almost say that whoever carved these had nothing to do with the buildings on the surface, or even the staircase. The level of sophistication is completely different. Any conclusions? Jordan LaForge shrugs. Hard to say, really. There are clearly some people here of various sizes. Small, medium, some giant-sized. This here might be a chair, or a throne of some sort. If we were on Earth and this was, say, ancient Egyptian, I'd say that these were slaves serving a pharaoh or some sort of god. But who knows? Uh, I mean, have we really learned the lesson that fortune doesn't always favour the brave? No, I don't think we have. Let's enter the chamber. No one's dead. Good. Uh, the crew didn't walk all the way down here for nothing. You instruct them to explore further. Maybe they can find the origin of that strange signal. The crew enters the large chamber, scanning about curiously with their headlamps to reveal a roughly circular room, approximately 50 metres in diameter and half a gain as high. The floor slopes down gently towards the centre of the room, with its lowest point being about 2 metres or so below ground level. At the lowest point is a dais, three stone steps heading up to a circular protrusion that appears to be some sort of platform. The walls of the room are encrusted with what appear to be rather intricate murals, although the potential effect is diminished somewhat by the ac activities of the subterranean creatures burrowing. Jean-Luc Picard appears uncertain what to do. What do you suggest, they ask? We investigate the murals or investigate the days. I think we should, Am I even saying that right? Days? Dies? Days? I don't know. Days we'll go with. Um, I think it's probably good to look at the murals first. It might give us an idea on what's going on. The crew begins a long, slow circuit of the room, moving clockwise and trying to make some sense of the murals. Apart from not being able to figure out if there's a beginning or an end, there's also the matter that the entire thing is only about halfway le legible. The burrowing creatures have made the surface look like it was riddled with bullets. Jordan LaForge nevertheless takes some extra time to try and discern meaning, moving slowly enough that some of the braver little creatures poke their heads out to watch from higher up, out of reach. Okay, I can't be sure, but if I'm reading this right, it's kind of creepy, says Jordan LaForge. There's some sort of force underneath the dais. It looks like some sort of spirit or ghost, but would they know that? It's a radio signal, right? It's giving off radio signals, you clarify. That doesn't tell us what it is. As to how they might know, maybe they can perceive it, like some animals can perceive magnetic fields. They nod. There's more, though. This part here, it shows someone opening the centre of the dais with an offering, and the spirit or signal or whatever, it's basically coming through them. Now, that could be symbi symbolic, or it could mean their chest is being ripped open, maybe some kind of sacrifice. The crew takes a moment to themselves and let you have and let them and you let them have it. It's not like they can break out a picnic lunch and play cards, but you let them mull about for a moment. Not for too long though. Don't want them getting the idea that this is home. This planet has its temptations, but it's not suitable for long term habitation. 
Clearly, whoever was here before found a good reason to leave. You hope the crew doesn't find the same reason. All right, let's look at the dais. The crew stumbles a bit as they approach the centre of the room due to the incline, but it's not so bad, and even if someone fell, the worst that would happen is they'd slide gently for a few seconds. The dais itself has three steps, or four if you include the round pedestal at the top. Somewhat concave, it, like the chamber around it, slopes down towards the centre. There are a few chips and scratches here and there, but overall the entire arrangement looks very solid. There's no sign of any mechanism or special function. Jean Picard asks, what should we do? I'll tell you what we should do. We should take a drink, because my voice is very, very rough. Ah, <coughs> Better. Just. Right, so, what we're going to do, we can look at the top of the dais, we can look at the sides of the dais, we can abandon the mission. I mean, chest ripping isn't good. A ghost, it's... Uh, You know what? I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. No one's died. I'd like to escape this. I, I don't think we're going to get anything off it. We could push and maybe lose somebody, but I, as I said, I'm just really open to not killing anyone in this episode. So, <laughs> so let's abandon the mission, I think. There's no time to mess around. Who knows what might happen if the crew pokes around? You instruct them to immediately make their way out of the room and up the staircase. The crew, somewhat disappointed in their findings on the surface, spends the flight back to the ship in sullen silence. The shuttle docks and they quickly gobble down a meal and retire, retire to their bunks as you prepare the ship to leave orbit. So uh, at least everyone's got uh, a little bit of experience off that. So, you know, it's not super bad. I mean, two missions... He's a medic and a leader now. He's super duper. Super duper. Uh, Geordi. About the same, isn't he? He's doing all right. Two, two of those. And, well, Dr. Phil. He was a bit green, but at least he's a decent medic now. So, all in all, not a major loss. Not a major loss. Upgrade log. That's just for the sensors, isn't it? We can look at this next time. We might start with that next time. But as it stands for this episode, I think that's where we shall call it. No one's died. That is a success in my eyes. Thank you for watching. As always, a like is appreciated. And I'll catch you on the next one. Take it easy.